I just want to say Merry Christmas to everyone. And it is going to be a great Christmas, I know, for a lot of you, for most of you. And I know there may be some that have had losses over the years, and you might be uh, thinking of this Christmas season as something that is a downer. And that's, that's, that's true for some people, and we have to keep that in mind. And so we pray for all of those that uh, experience that type of a, of a Christmas, because I know that even if you might be alone in this Christmas season, Christ is with you. And that's what we want to preach every Sunday here at NCC, that our hope, come on, is in Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He loves us so much. God sent his son. And Christmas is a, is a time of generosity. It's a time of giving. It's a time we empty our wallets for our kids, and, you know, it's one of those things that it just happens. Christmas is already here. I can't believe it. Many of you are preparing to give some gifts, and I know kids are waiting for the gifts, and Christmas Day comes, and you unwrap the gifts, songs that tell us the kind of gifts that people long for, like a partridge in a pear tree. I never could figure that one out, and I couldn't figure out the one about figgy pudding, I get the one about the two front teeth because, you know, hey, every kid that's lost his teeth wants to have his two front teeth for Christmas. So what do you want for Christmas? Think about that. What are you longing for for Christmas? What would be the best Christmas gift ever? Or maybe this one. Have you, what, what, what's been the best Christmas you've ever had? Think about, think about that. What, what would that be? What would that look like? Uh, because gift giving is a, is a tremendous thing, but gift receiving is also good. And so we have gift givers here today and those that are going to receive gifts. And today, though, we're celebrating the greatest gift of all, God's gift of his son. And I also want to mention a gift, a, a generous gift that was given to NCC because, you know, we're a generous church and it always comes back. Well, one of the best Christmas gifts I think any church could get would be the one we received, and it's this LED wall from Grace Church down in Houston, a $30,000 LED wall. Come on, let's give it up for Grace Church. Some of the pastors might be watching online. We just want to say thank you to Grace Church. And by the way, underneath your seat, everybody gets a... No, I'm just kidding. We're going to read from some scripture today. We're in the series full, and of course, when you think of Christ and you think of the Christmas narrative, you have to include the word joy or joyful expectation. And I want us to take a look at a scripture that we can just start from there and see how that unfolds in our lives. It's, it's a story that, uh, that, you know, affects all of us, the Christmas story. And when you, when you read this particular verse of scripture, Psalm 16, verses 10 and 11, this is speaking of Christ, but I think it also refers to us. Check this out on the screen. Psalm 16, 11, uh, 10 and 11. We're going to read it together. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is a powerful place of scripture. David writes this. Peter picks up the same verse in Acts chapter two. And I want us to pray about how God's joy can be our reality this year. Father, we want to thank you for today. Thank you for this worship experience, for the opportunity to study your word together, to sing songs and to be in fellowship. And I pray, Lord, that during this Christmas holiday that we could truly know what it's all about, that we could keep our eyes on you and our focus on you, that we could fixate on you. And we give you praise today in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. Imagine with me if you could create a new world. What, what would that look like? If you could create a new one, what would this new world look like? Would it be a place of physical beauty? Would it be a place of cultural splendor, humans flourishing in harmony? I want you just to imagine with me, if you could create a new world, what would it look like? Would there be snow? I would say, yes, we need some snow. Some would say, no snow. But let's just imagine, what kind of world would you create? If you just took the limits off, Maybe, maybe you're looking at endless rollbacks at Walmart. Maybe that would be a perfect world for you. Or maybe a lifetime supply of Starbucks coffee. Or 10 years worth of fries from Chick 
filet with the special sauce. I'm trying to get someone to dream here today. Just dream with me. Let's do this. It'd be a place of justice, I know. If we created a new world, a place of, a place of peace and joy, a place with no sorrow, a place with no suffering. Hey, what kind of person would you want to be? If you could make yourself new, what would you look like? Would you have six-pack abs? Would you have trim biceps? Would you be a beautiful and happy person, someone that others would want to be around? Hey, believe it or not, I've got some good news for you, and that is because of Jesus, this is going to be a reality. Now, maybe not Robux at, Starbucks or Robux at Walmart or maybe not the six-pack abs, but I believe that, the, the, that a great new world is available and becoming new people is available for everyone in this room today because the Christmas story helps us live with the anticipation and the expectation of a bright future with God for eternity. God's creation, you and I living in harmony, living in peace with family and friends, good times. That's what it's all about. See, our joyful expectation is that Christ will replace the old with the new. This is a hope that we see throughout all of Scripture and so when we think of Christmas, you've got to think of the word Advent because it means arrival or coming. So the first Advent is the arrival of Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem. This was the first Advent, the second Advent or the second coming. This is all part of the gospel or the Chris Christmas narrative, and it's an adventure and I have the word advent in the word adventure. I, just to play on words here, it's an adventure. The Christian life is, is something that we should see as exciting, something that's wonderful, something that is amazing. We, we are called to live with joyful expectation. It, it behooves us. It's, it's incumbent upon us. But the problem, and I just want to include myself here, because if we're not careful, we can be so cynical and so angry at the way things are going in our world. And we lose hope. I've talked to friends, I've talked to family members, I've talked to pastors, Christian leaders. This is something that people are struggling with. We, you know, we don't intend on becoming cynical. We don't intend on, on you know, being angry. But you see, we stop expecting things to change for the better. We, we forget why we should believe in Christ. So how, how, do we get on in, how do we get in on this good news? How can we soak this up? I think it starts with being honest. You know, it's hard to be honest, but we need to be painfully honest. We, we, we are a lot older than we want to admit. Now, when I say old, I'm not referring to age or a number. I'm talking about a mindset or a selfish existence. See, when we're full of self, and it's, and it's all about taking in, it's going to be hard to be full of joy or full of expectation. I like what Paul said to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. Look, what, look how this reads in the New Century Version. It says, you were taught to leave your old self. And I highlighted that word old, old self. And to stop living the evil way you lived before. That old self becomes worse. Because people are fooled by the evil things they want to do. But you were taught to be made new in your hearts and to become a new person. This is what the gospel teaches us. This is what grace teaches us. So I think we have to stop airbrushing ourselves. We have to stop pretending that we're, that we're better than we really are. Because deep down, I think we all know instinctively how mean and how old and how broken humanity really is especially now. But we're good at covering it up, and the, the key is to not cover it up, to, 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 to just expose it for what it is, because you have to expose it and see the bad news before we can really receive the good news. See, humanity is in a darker, crankier, and less attractive state of mind than, than we want to admit. There's a lot of cranky, angry, mean, rude people in the world and I, I think people try to act like they're young. They try to act like they're full of innocence. And, but there's a part of humans, the part of mankind that's very old, that, that's very grumpy, very selfish, very sinful, as old as the devil himself. So selfishness is, a, is the universal story of mankind. People instinctively know, I think everyone in this room would agree, that the words uh, unhappy, selfish, and old 
go together, which is why many Christian, fa- uh, excuse me, many Christmas fables include these selfish old curmudgeons who lack joy and lack generosity. For example, Scrooge and the Grinch are these unhappy, selfish old souls that are anti-Christmas personified. They're anti-Christmas incarnate. You know the story of Scrooge. You know the story of Grinch. You know, the Grinch was 53 years, 53 years of looking from his perch high up on the hill down on Whoville. And, and you read in scripture about the Grinch. No, you don't read in scripture. I'm sorry. Dr. Seuss is the one that wrote this. But the Grinch doesn't like people to celebrate or to sing or to be happy or to talk about Christmas. He has a, he has, he has a heart that is so small in the storyline. His heart is so tiny. It's half the size. So we have to be honest today in order to fully appreciate and to take in the Christmas story. We've got to contrast the ugliness of this world with the beauty of the gospel. We have to contrast the badness of humanity with the goodness of Jesus. We have to contrast the old versus the new. But why are things getting older? I want you to just put on your thinking cap here today. Things are getting older. Yes, they are. Why? Well, the universal law of decay the law of entropy shows that things wind down. Things don't evolve and get better. Things, get, things wind down and, 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 and get old. Things tend to rot, to rust, to mold, to decay. This is the way nature is right now. Life gets old. We get old. The earth is not getting any younger. The earth is getting older. And life itself can become so boring and so monotonous over time because our, our relationships can even get old. And stale. Believe it or not, without Christ, everything just keeps getting older and older. Without Christ in our lives, we look at life through a filter, through a lens that is so negative and so corrupt. And and I think instinctively, everyone today would say, yes, we know there's something wrong. There's something broken with human nature. And so what happens sometimes, we're tempted to try to fix ourselves with self-help programs and self-improvement programs and Hey, we've got to diet, have some cool clothes. Maybe if I exercise or I shop for some new things, then maybe I'll feel better about life. You see, these things really don't work. They don't bring us the answer that we're looking for because, because humanity is out of sorts with God. There's, there's a separation from, between God and humanity. And so in theological terms, humanity has fallen. Nature is fallen. This is, this is the curse In Jude, verse 24, you won't see this on the screen. It says, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. Someone say exceeding joy. Come on, everybody say exceeding joy. Come on, say exciting joy, abundant joy, full joy. There's the kind of joy, biblical joy that just is so amazing, but there are many people that are lacking this joy. Because of Adam and Eve listening to Satan, the entire human race and all of creation is in this state of dystopia. And so if you're upset, if you're bothered, if you're discouraged about getting old, just blame Satan. Point your finger at Satan. Because we don't want to get old. Nobody wants to get old. Nobody wants to have that feeling of winding down. So he's the reason why things tend to grow old and things tend to decay. He's responsible for the death gene. I guess we could say that. You know, the statistics say that one out of every one person will die. That's depressing, isn't it? Merry Christmas, everyone. (laughs) But it all points back to Adam and Eve in the garden, listening to Satan as he beguiled them with this appeal to self. Paradise was lost and the rest is history. Everything now is in a cursed state. It's getting older and decaying. But see, because of the first coming of Jesus, and we celebrate that every Christmas, and also the second coming of Jesus, which we believe and hope for, we know that everything is not always going to be as it is now. When John saw the future, when God gave John this revelation of things to come, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1, look how this reads. It says, he saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. It's like almost like a movie, right? And he sees the dragon. Look at the words here. He sees the dragon. And then here's the descriptor. That old, 
that old serpent, who is the devil, Satan, and he bound him in chains for a thousand years. And the angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which then he shut and locked it so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were finished. Now, I don't want to get into eschatology or, the, the, you know, trying to interpret how, is this the end? I, you know, I, I don't want to get into that because our hope is really Jesus. But, but notice how Satan is described in, this, in, in these verses. He's described, first of all, as old. He's very old and he's reptilian. He, he's just an old reptile. And when you read the book of Revelation, I know growing up, it was a scary book for me, and I don't want you to think of the book of Revelation as a scary book. It's really a testimony of Jesus and how Jesus is, is, is it's a behind-the-scenes look at how Christ ultimately will rescue and redeem his people from that old reptilian power. So, so Christmas is the celebration of that. It's a celebration of, of a takeover a takeover of, of God's kingdom taking over worldly kingdom, Satan's kingdom. Satan is the ruler of this world right now. He is the God of this world. He's behind the scenes pulling the strings. But it's not always going to be that way. Check this out. Y'all know that Christmas song, an old one. You're going to have to help me. I'm not going to sing it, but we're going to look at the lyrics. God rest ye merry gentlemen. You guys know that song? You've heard it? Let's, let's try to, I'll, I'll say a few words and then you, you let's, let's see if you know it. God, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing, you dismay, remember Christ, our Savior, was born on Christmas Day to, to save us all from what? Satan's power. This is a Christmas song we're singing about Satan. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray, oh of what? Comfort and joy, comfort and joy. This is what comforts us. This is what brings us joy. The reason why Christ came. One scripture says that Christ came to destroy the works of Satan. So the reality of this truth I admit today is not for the faint of heart. It's not for those that want to just look at the Christmas story on a flannel graph board in Sunday school and sing away in a manger and that's all we look at. The beauty is that because of Christ, we can expect, y'all, an, an eternal future of comfort and joy where Christ has authority over all disease, over all death, over all decay, and in the devil himself. When Christ returns, neither Satan nor the curse will negatively affect the earth anymore. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, paradise restored, Eden restored. Even the earth itself, the creation itself, is awaiting that day and expects for a better day. I think one of the most striking aspects of the Christmas narrative is this paradoxical story of the origin of Jesus, the nature of Jesus, and why Jesus came to earth in the first place. You know, when you look at, at Scripture, you see that Jesus, he's not surprised by all the bad things that are happening in our world. He's not freaked out by the sinful nature of of humanity. Since the beginning of time, the world has been a bad place. Bad things have happened. But see, Jesus is the personal remedy for all things bad. He's the personal remedy for all hatred, all war, all injustice, all famine, all brokenness, all disease, all gr greed and theft and murder. He's the personal remedy. So when you look at the paradox of Jesus coming 2,000 years ago, it's the contrast of glory and dishonor. It's the contrast of power and in weakness. It's the contrast of triumph in defeat. It's profound. This, this paradoxically throws the world's values in reversal. For example, his birth was humble. His claims to be Messiah were, were so low-key. His miracles were relatively quiet and understated. So in other words, this is not what people would have expected. It, it, it just blew their minds. How We wouldn't expect a sovereign God to come to earth this way. I mean, when you read the Old Testament, you get the feeling, you go through the scriptures of the Old Testament, you see how the Jewish people were, were awaiting the Messiah. You get the feeling that, that God's arrival to earth would be something more powerful and apocalyptic. And man, things are being thrown down, judging the nations with authority and shaking the earth and bringing the wicked to a speedy justice. I mean, that's what you would expect, right? But see, Christ's first coming to this old and broken world is much different than what people would have expected. It wasn't really impressive. 
I mean, think of it. The creator of the world coming to earth in diapers. Think about that. Born in a stable, a small town, grew up among people that that knew him and took him for granted and and then rejected him and then the crowd eventually crucified him. I mean, see, y'all, this was the plan all along. This was not a surprise. This has been the plan. So if there's anything that we need to remember from the story of Christ coming to earth 2,000 years ago are the words that all things are going to be made new. Matter of fact, the Christmas story teaches us that Christ coming to earth is to make all things new to reverse the curse. And I think the reason that you and I would struggle, like actually believing this, oh, we love to sing the songs, we love to come to church and hear sermons and have Bible study groups and all this, but to really believe that there's good news here, it's hard to believe it because right now, look around, the world, the whole world is under the temporary power of this old reptilian evil one and things are not like we want them to be. The world is broken Many people have not heard the good news that Jesus is king. Matter of fact, there are a lot of people that believe that that fear is king. You know, the the fear of a virus. And matter of fact, the the name of the virus is corona, which, which means crown. It's the word crown. Like when someone is coronated, they're crowned king. And so the coronavirus, the one, the novel one that we're experiencing now, is somewhat new, but the, the coronavirus strain, all there's hundreds, maybe thousands of strains of corona that affect animals and affect humans alike. And I think it can be traced all the way back, all the way back to the Garden of Eden when God said to Adam and Eve, the very day you eat of the tree, you will die. In other words, death is going to be introduced. They could have lived forever and eaten of the tree of life, but they listened to Satan and the rest is history. Now there's death, there's disease, there's thorns. Matter of fact, God told Adam, thorns are going to grow up. So this was symbolic of this curse. And yet when Christ came, he came and the angel announced that this this was going to be a baby, but the baby was going to be a king. And the wise men came from the east and said, where is this, this king of the Jews? We want to worship him. And Herod said, tell me where he is. I'm going to worship him too. He, he wasn't going to worship Jesus. He was going to, he, matter of fact, he had all the babies killed in that area. There were like 30,000 babies killed in the whole region in Judea because he was threatened. Someone in diapers was more powerful than him. Yeah, he was a king. He was a ruler. But there was one that was coming that was so strong, so powerful, so mighty. So he lived a simple life didn't have a place to lay his head. He was marginalized. He was criticized. He was ultimately crucified. And as they put lashes on his back and as they nailed his hands to a cross, he wore a crown of thorns, a a crown of thorns. You, you, you gotta, you gotta see what we're seeing. You gotta see this because Jesus really is King. He was King. He always has been King, but the world mocked him and said, here is your king of the Jews, and let's crown him. They crowned him with thorns. And so, yes, he died a sinner's death. He died a shameful death. He died a sacrificial death so that you and I could live. He rose again from the dead on the third day. He ascended to the Father. We all know this. And the Bible says that he's coming back, y'all. He's coming back with these words on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Bible says that when Christ comes as king, he's going to rule and reign. And the kingdoms of this world, I feel like preaching today, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. He's going to reign over death. He's going to reign over disease. He's going to reign over all the earthly kingdoms. He's going to set his foot down, and and we're going to rule and reign with him. See, Either Christ is in control or he's not. We just got to write this down. Either, 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 either he is personally interested in the details of our lives or he's not. Either God has a plan or he doesn't. If, if he's not ultimately in control and if he does not have a plan that we, we do need to be scared. We need to be scared, you know, to the nth degree. The gospel shows us that, that he is acquainted with us He knows us. He's involved in our lives. Christ came to make us God's children, God's kids. We now have a new identity. We have a new king. Nothing happens without his permission in our lives. And so when Jesus walked the earth, think about this for a minute, he he performed these amazing miracles. He had power over the elements. 
he would touch the blinded eye and reverse that. Diseased bodies, he would reverse that. Death, people that were dead came back to life. He reversed that. He's all about turning things on its head. And this is really showing us what things will look like when he returns. In Romans chapter, I love this, in chapter 8 and verse 19, check it out, y'all. It says, for all creation, and underscored all creation, is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right now up into this present time. I'm looking at my dog Onyx and I say, Onyx, do you know something that I don't know? I mean, it says that all of creation, your cat that's clawing up your couch right now is probably more excited about Jesus returning than you are because the nature itself knows. Just like the animals went on Noah's Ark, they they knew. So when Christ comes, things are going to be restored. The Bible says the lion is going to lay with the lamb. That means the lion is not going to gobble up the lamb for food. The leopard is not going to chase the antelope. The leopard will eat grass in the field like the cattle, according to Isaiah's prophecy. This is, a, this, is a new, this is a new world that God has promised. Creation is looking for a better day. Under Christ's rule, everything is going to be back on track. And the creatures of the earth instinctively know this. We read this in, in Romans. In, in the meantime, in the meantime, look what's happening. The, the world right now is groaning. It's groaning under the weight of cruelty. It's groaning under the weight of bloodshed and wars. It's groaning under the weight of religious oppression and sexual exploitation. The world is groaning right now under financial debt. The world is groaning under under all of the the evil that's upon it. Right now, two-thirds of the world live on less than $1 a day. Many nations right now and the economies of many nations are crumbling because of fear over a virus. Right now, there's more human slave trafficking than ever in human history. Millions live below the poverty line here in America. There's there's an escalation of of civil tension and racial unrest. The, The earth is more broken than what people want to admit. It's because humanity is separated from God at odds with the creator. And and we're we're in desperate need of a saving grace. So this is why we're telling the Christmas story. Our joyful expectation of being made new is not too good to be true. Matter of fact, it is true. When we accept the gospel and we know who we are in Christ, we have this now joyful anticipation, this joyful expectation of being transformed, even though it sounds utopian or too good to be true. You know, the words utopia or dystopia, they're, they're similar words, but the opposite in meaning, they're, they, they describe places or states of mind. When you think of utopia, you think of paradise. When you think of utopia, you think of something beautiful, something amazing, Eden restored. This is utopia. So, oh, you know, Pastor Simeon, you're preaching of this utopia. Well, the Bible talks about a new and better day. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't, Don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go... To prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, and that where I am, there you may be also. So there's a utopia, or there's this this better world that we have awaiting us. Dystopia is the opposite of that. It's, It's characterized by all things inhumane, all things frightening, such as evil powers or totalitarian governments or civil unrest, and on and on we can go. Death itself. And so dystopian concepts have appeared in many movies, like, for example, Hunger Games. There were four that came out, right? Four Hunger Games uh, movies, and it's about how a totalitarian government gets everyone to cower in fear and that young people fight to the death. And this is maybe a picture of things to come because, you know, movies often mirror the mindset of the masses is what people say. Well, that remains to be seen, but I think we could just nail this down, that all of us instinctively know Think about it, that things are not as they should be. 
It, it, it shouldn't be this way. My parents. I'm not going to spend Christmas with my parents. I think one of the first time in my life. Because the world is crazy right now. That hurts. And, and, and I, I, in my study time, in preparing for this sermon, I said, Lord, let me preach this in a way that makes sense to an eighth grader. It, let, let it be so simple. Let it be something that we can hold on to because while we're unwrapping the gifts and we've got lights and tinsel and foil and reindeer on the roof and click, 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 and Santa Claus is coming down the chimney and we're trying to pacify ourselves with hot mocha and my wife's fudge. I still come back to this, like the world is bad right now. It's just, I don't like it. I don't like the way the world is. Maybe there are some that are watching from home and you don't like it either. You just, you don't feel safe. There's, there's a struggle that we're in. We're in this struggle together. The biblical view of the future teaches us that when we, when we receive Christ, we can expect to flourish eternally and to live in peace with God forever. In Revelation 22, 1, I love this. It says, then the angel showed me a river, the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And it flowed down the center of Main Street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit. So it's, you know, it's going back to the, the Garden of Eden again, right? With fresh crop each month, look at this, the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. God's awesome, right? This is so practical, right? No longer will there be a curse on anything. No more curse. No more dystopia. No more suffering. No more violence. No more sickness. The Father loved His creation so much that He sent His Son, baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, so fragile. Newsflash, Jesus doesn't live in a crib anymore. We gotta get Jesus out of the crib. Yeah, we celebrate the virgin birth, but we also celebrate the fact that he's coming back with authority, power, King of Kings. Isaiah 9, 6, stand with me. We're going to read this together. I think it would be great for us to read this aloud. It's one of my favorite prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ coming. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Let's look at it. Let's, can we read this out loud together? And let's use our big voices together. I mean, let's shout it if we can. One, two, three, let's do it. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. Thank God for his word today that is a lamp to our feet, a light to our pathway, helps us see what's going on and helps us have hope and a joyful expectation that the government will rest on his shoulders because he's king. Come on, somebody shout out. Jesus is king. Let me pray for you today. Father, I want to thank you for the hope of the gospel. Thank you for that renewed insight of what it's all about. Help us to latch on to it this Christmas season, share it with our families. Help us look forward to a better day. In the meantime, we're not giving up. We're holding on. We're trusting in your word. We're not going to throw in the towel. We know, God, that you work all things after the counsel of your own will because you're sovereign, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen.